สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our Pali Canon and English Study Group, and we're starting a brand new book, Volume 8. We're studying chapters 1 through 10 today. The title of this book is The Foremost Householder. This is a collection of teachings from Gautama Buddha, where he's sharing with you teachings to help a household practitioner be able to get to enlightenment. This is part of the words of the Buddha, the path to enlightenment, revealing the hidden book series, where there's 13 volumes of books, all based on the original words of the Buddha. You can download these books at no cost by going to buddhadailywisdom.com, and you'll be able to see the links there under free books to be able to then download each of the individual 13 books of the book series that are the original words of the Buddha. You're welcome to take those books and go print them, or you can order them in printed version or Kindle version through Amazon if you have access to Amazon in your country. So I'd like to welcome all of you to today's class and invite you to study along with us the words of the Buddha here using this book, The Foremost Householder, volume eight of this book series. The way that I conduct our class is I will typically start with a meditation, but considering the length of the chapters today, we're just going to go right into actually studying the individual chapters. And the way that I do this is I will typically ask for a volunteer if there's someone in Zoom who would like to read the individual chapters, you can read the chapters, then I will share some teachings on those, and then open up to any and all questions that you guys have, whether you're in Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, you can put your questions in the comment section. I'll be able to see that and then answer any questions that you might have. And if you're in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand to ask any questions or follow-up questions. And if you'd like to read and you're in Zoom, you can raise your hand electronically, and then I'll be able to call on you to have you read any of the chapters that you like. So I'm just going to switch.
I thought I had addressed that before. Okay, now you guys should have sound there. I apologize. Thank you, Chrissy, for letting me know that. Uh, you guys should have sound now. I appreciate that. All right, so let me see if there's any questions here. Uh, okay, Chrissy's saying the same thing in Facebook as well. Thank you, Chrissy. I appreciate the, the feedback there. So now folks in YouTube and Facebook should be able to hear me. All right, so it doesn't look like we have any other questions or comments. So I'm going to move on to chapter three. Chapter three is repaying one's mother. Oh, I see Koshi has a question. Go ahead, Koshi. Koshi. You have to unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can read this for you. So I was raising my hand. Oh, perfect. Go for it. This is a great chapter. Okay. Yeah, repaying one's mother and father. Monks, there are two persons that cannot easily be repaid. What two? One's mother and father. Even if one should carry about one's mother on one shoulder and one's father on the other, and while doing so, should have a lifespan of a hundred years, living for a, live for a hundred years, and if one should attend to them by anointing them with balms, by massaging, bathing, and rubbing their limbs, and even void their urine and excrement there, one still would not have done enough for one's parents nor would ha one have repaid them. Even if one were to establish one's parents as the supreme lords and rulers over this great earth abounding in the seven treasures, one still would not have done enough for one's parents, nor would one have repaid them. For what reason? Parents are of great help to their children. They bring them up, feed them, and show them the world. But monks, if when one's parents lack confidence, one encourages, settles, and establishes them in confidence. If when one's parents are unwholesome, one encourages, settles, and establishes them in virtuous behavior, moral conduct. If one when one's parents are selfish, one encourages, settles, and establishes them in generosity. If when one's parents are unwise, one encourages, settles, and establishes them in wisdom in such a way, one has done enough for one's parents, repaid them, and done more than enough for them. All right. Thank you, Kushi. <clears throat> so here, the Buddha is talking at the beginning, and you can visualize this, right? That if you carried your mother on one shoulder, and you carried your father on another shoulder, and you lived for a hundred years. And in doing so, you massage them, you bathe them, you rub their limbs, you cleaned up their urine and their feces, that the Buddha is saying, you still haven't done enough to repay your parents for all that they've done. And he even goes in and says, if you establish your parents as the supreme lords and rulers with this amazing wealth, essentially providing them all these material objects, you still haven't repaid your parents enough. And then he says, for what reason? Because parents are of great help to their children. They bring them up, feed them, and show them the world. So essentially, our parents help to sustain our life and bring us into this world. Getting into a human birth is the most ideal birth that you could ever get to because now you have an opportunity to get to enlightenment from this human birth. Where in the heavenly birth, you also have the opportunity to get to enlightenment there. But as you heard me share, it's oftentimes not the case because beings are oftentimes complacent. But here in the human realm, we have all the perfect conditions in which to motivate us and encourage us to be able to get to enlightenment because we experience not only pleasant feelings, but painful feelings and neither painful nor pleasant feelings as well. So there's this debt of gratitude that we should have in this appreciation for our parents, even if we didn't agree with the way our parents did certain things in our life. Because I haven't really met too many people that agreed with 100% of the things their parents ever did in their life. Of course, you're going to have certain expectations and cravings wanting your parents to be a certain way. And there's a good chance that you didn't agree with certain things that your children, or I'm sorry, that your parents did as you were growing up as a child. 
So those are just your craving, desire, attachment. So you might have gotten angry or frustrated at your parents at different times because you disagreed with what they did and you had certain expectations of them. But nonetheless, they did bring you into this world, helping you to come into the world, especially your mother. Having her, having you in her stomach for nine months is very challenging. And to go through labor pains and birthing and all of that, it's very significant and very impactful for a woman to carry a child and then deliver it. So there's this debt of gratitude that we should always remind ourselves about, even if we didn't agree with the things that our parents did in our life. So there's situations where you might notice that you have more wisdom or you might have certain understanding of the path to enlightenment that your parents don't have. And as you become more and more awake and you become more enlightened, you might see that your parents are really struggling in the world. And the Buddha is essentially saying, when you see that occurring, then you can essentially aim to help them to be able to then develop on the path to enlightenment. But keep in mind, you need to be very uh, skillful when you're doing this, because oftentimes a parent's mind might have a certain amount of ego and they look at you as a child. And if you started to just teach them, it could be very challenging for your relationship. You need to remain humble when you're doing this. And the Buddha gives you four things to be aware of. And as you see these things, he gives you solutions to be able to help. He talks about when your parents are lacking confidence. Lacking confidence is when they lack confidence in the Buddha, the teachings, or the community. And where you see this, you can just kind of gradually, skillfully share things here and there that help your parents. So if your parents over a period of time are noticing that you're becoming more peaceful and more joyful, they might comment to you like, wow, you're so much more joyful than you used to be. You might just say, yeah, that's the teachings of the Buddha. I've been learning those and practicing those. They really work. You might consider learning them at some point, right? You can just kind of leave it at that, you know, just something simple. Uh, so that's encouraging, settling, and establishing them in confidence. And there's certain ways that you could potentially do that. You might even give them a book of the teachings of the Buddha or invite them to a class or a retreat or something like that. When one's parents are unwholesome, the Buddha is saying that you try to encourage, settle, and establish them in virtuous behavior. So if you see your parents are into drugs or alcohol or having other difficulties in life with their moral conduct, maybe they're lying or stealing or things like this, you might decide to try to help them to establish virtuous moral conduct, which requires you to be humble when you're doing that. If you notice that your parents are selfish, you might encourage and settle and establish them in generosity because this is going to help them eliminate craving, desire, attachment. So if your parents are holding on to their material wealth very tightly, you might encourage them to practice generosity and uh, practice giving and sharing their time, their effort, their energy, and their resources without any expectation of anything in return. And then also, if you notice that your parents are unwise and making unwise decisions, you might try to establish them in wisdom. And the Buddha is saying, having done these four things, then you've done enough. Because if you had the option of pressing this button and your parents would stay angry and hateful or bitter or discontent, maybe frustrated or guilty or shameful or bored or lonely, and if you could press that button, they would stay that way for the rest of their life. Or you could press this button and now they would be peaceful and joyful for the rest of their life. I think that the vast majority of children would press the button where their parents could be peaceful and joyful for the rest of their life. Well, it's not pressing a button. You can't press a button to create that, but establishing them in confidence and moral conduct and generosity and in wisdom is what will help lead to their peacefulness and joy. So that's the way to repay your parents for this debt of gratitude that one might have as part of being brought into the world. Regardless of whether you agree or disagree with how your parents brought you up, they did help you get to this point where you can sustain your life. And now as an adult, you're able to make wise decisions for your own life. So no matter what they did, they still at least gave you food, water, clothing, shelter, and medical care to a certain degree that you were able to then sustain your life. And of course, nowadays there's some situations where a parent might have been a very abusive and you might decide to completely go away from your parents and that's a decision that you've made and maybe you've decided you're never going back. Maybe they've 
physically abused you, verbally abused you, or maybe sexually abused you. And if that's your case, that you're never going to go back and see your parents ever again, then you can be at peace with that because it might be unwise for you to go back and enter into that relationship. But at least if you can train your mind to eliminate any anger or hatred or ill will towards your parents, because holding on to that is only going to harm you so that you can at least get to this point of appreciation and gratitude for at least the fact that they allowed you to be able to sustain your life. And now you have this opportunity to get to enlightenment. So let me know what questions you guys have. Again, you can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Or in Zoom, you can raise your hand and ask any questions that you like. Looks like we have a question here coming in on Zoom. This is from Francis. What should we do if parents don't respond positively to our sharing of the Dhamma, still very stubborn to old ways of life? So what I suggest you do is that you try two or three times over the course of maybe a year or so. And if they are not interested to learn and practice, then just choose to no longer share with them. Because the Buddha here isn't telling you to force your parents. He's not telling you to have craving desire attachment to try to convince your parents to learn and practice. He's just saying where you observe that they're having challenges with these four areas, then you try to help them. But if you kept pushing and pushing and pushing, then that's your craving desire attachment. Also, I would encourage you to be uh, aware of labeling your parents as stubborn because this is kind of like judging them and this is like looking down on them and labeling them as being stubborn. Instead, just understand that their mind is craving. There's a certain amount of clinging to the old way of life and their old way of doing things. This is due to the unknowing of true reality or that confusion, that misunderstanding, that ignorance. So rather than think of them as stubborn, which kind of takes a bit of a negative connotation, just change your perspective and have concern for their misfortune, which is compassion. Just have compassion for them and have loving kindness where you have this genuine interest in seeing them be well, but you understand them being well is based on their decisions. You can't force them to make decisions that would improve their life. Only they can choose to do that. And they may need to be reborn. This is just the way that things happen is that not every being in this particular lifetime is going to choose to learn and practice these teachings. And they may need to be reborn more times in order to get to the point where they're able to learn and practice these teachings. And that's okay. That's what they've been experiencing their whole life throughout multiple lives. And if they need to be reborn more then okay, that's what they experience. If they are continuing to be frustrated and irritated and annoyed, Okay, that's what they're experiencing. That's their karma. But in order for you to get to peacefulness and joy, you're going to need to eliminate any craving or clinging, any expectation you have of wanting your parents to learn and practice the teachings. But where possible, you can just lightly help them. And if you've tried two or three times and they just haven't taken to the teachings, then what the Buddha is sharing here is you've done enough for your parents. So he's not convincing you or guiding you to force your parents. He's just saying, that you should try to help them where you can. And then where you've done that, you've done enough. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions on Facebook or YouTube. So let's go ahead and move to the next chapter, which is chapter four. Oh, it looks like uh, Francis is saying something else. So just see things as they are, uh, just so be with it, yes. Exactly. So you try it. You try to help your parents. And if they don't take to the teachings, then okay, so be it. You know, that's their life. That's their decision. You've attempted to help them, but just let it go. That's the middle way. Whereas if you did nothing to help your parents and you were just working towards getting better and better and you're learning all these things and you never tried to help them, you wouldn't feel comfortable there. But also if you chase and chase and force and crave and long and yearn to help them, your mind's not going to be peaceful there either. So the middle way is you try two or three times perhaps. And then if they don't take to the teachings and they're just disinterested, then okay, just understand that any kind of unwholesome results that they experience in life is a result of their decisions. There were times where I was helping my mom and uh, during her life. And she knew that I would help her and she would see that the things I was sharing were very helpful, but she wouldn't do what I suggested. There were even times where she would come to me for advice and she would ask me questions and then I would give her advice. 
And she would say, David, I know your advice is right on. And every time you've ever given me advice, it's been very accurate. But just to let you know, I'm not going to do what you suggested. And I said, okay, that's up to you, mom, whatever you'd like to do. So then she would go out and she would implement her decisions. And she'd come back six months later and say, David, you were right again. I did what I thought I should do. And I didn't follow what you suggested. And it turned out exactly the way you said it would. And um, I should have learned to listen to you by now. So sometimes your parents need to see that over and over and over again. And even still, when my mom knew that my advice was right on and accurate, she still would just do it a different way. And you just need to be okay with that and let go. All right? That's where you get to peacefulness. You share, you try to help, but if they're not interested in making those decisions, then so be it. They'll experience the results of whatever decisions they make. So this chapter here, chapter four, is titled Three Difficulties That Separate Mother and Son. So while this one, the Buddha is referring to mother and son, you could also think about this as mother and daughter or father and son or father and daughter as well. He just happens to be teaching based on these particular roles, but it applies to other roles as well. Here he says, monks, the uninstructed worldling speaks of these three difficulties that separate mother and son. What three? There comes a time when a great wildfire arises. When the great wildfire has arisen, it burns up villages, towns, and cities. When villages, towns, and cities are burning up, the mother does not find her son, and the son does not find his mother. This is the first difficulty that separates mother and son, of which the uninstructed no the uninstructed worldling speaks. Again, there comes a time when a great rain cloud arises. When the great rain cloud ar has arisen, a great landslide takes place. When the great landslide takes place, villages, towns, and cities are swept away. When villages, towns, and cities are being swept away, the mother does not find her son, and the son does not find his mother. This is the second difficulty that separates mother and son, of which the uninstructed worldling speaks. Again, there comes a time of a dangerous windstorm in the wilderness when the people of the countryside mounted on their vehicles flee in all sides. Flee on all sides. When there is a dangerous windstorm in the wilderness, the people of the countryside mounted on their vehicles, are fleeing on all sides. The mother does not find her son, and the son does not find his mother. This is the third difficulty that separates mother and son, of which the uninstructed worldling speaks. These are the three difficulties that separate mother and son, of which the uninstructed worldling speaks. There are amongst these three difficulties when mother and son reconnect that the uninstructed worldling speaks of as difficulties that separate mother and son. What three? There comes a time when a great wildfire arises, when a great rain cloud arises, and there comes a time of a dangerous windstorm in the wilderness. There is sometimes an occasion when the mother finds her son and the son finds his mother. These are the three difficulties when mother and son reconnect that the uninstructed worldling speaks of as difficulties that separate mother and son. There are monks these three difficulties that separate mother and son. What three? The difficulty of old age, the difficulty of illness, and the difficulty of death. When the son is growing old, the mother cannot fulfill her wish. Let me grow old, but may my son not grow old. And when the mother is growing old, the son cannot fulfill his wish, let me grow old, but may my mother not grow old. When the son has fallen ill, the mother cannot fulfill her wish, let me fall ill, but may my son not fall ill. And when the mother has fallen ill, the son cannot fulfill his wish, let me fall ill, but may my mother not fall ill. When the son is dying, the mother cannot fulfill her wish, let me die, but may my son not die. And when the mother is dying, the son cannot fulfill his wish, let me die, 
but may my mother not die. These are the three difficulties that separate mother and son. There is a path, monks. There is a way that leads to the abandoning and overcoming of these three difficulties when mother and son reconnect and of these three difficulties that separate mother and son. And what is the path in the way? It is just this noble eightfold path that is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. This is the path in the way that leads to the abandoning and overcoming of these three difficulties when mother and son reconnect and of these three difficulties that separate mother and son. Okay, so the Buddha is really honing in on the attachment that a child might have to a parent and a parent might have to a child. And he's talking here at the beginning of these three kind of natural events that are occurring that could separate a parent and a child. And that this, of course, is very challenging because if there's attachment, the mind is going to have certain discontentedness based on that. Then he eventually gets to a point where he's talking about these other situations where a individual who is a parent or a child could have difficulties and struggle. It's when they see their parents growing old, having illness, or because of getting close to death. And the same thing is true when a parent sees their child getting old, having illness, or nearing death, that the individuals would really struggle and have discontentedness during this period of time. Well, the Buddha explains that there's a way to eliminate this. And the way to eliminate it is the Eightfold Path, because that's what's going to eliminate the discontentedness and the difficulties that, over, that are experienced during the time of the uh, aging, sickness, and death. Whether it's you looking at your parents and having discontentedness due to that, or parents looking at a child and having discontentedness due to seeing that they're aging, they're sick, or they're dying. Because if you can eliminate craving, desire, attachment, you can eliminate the difficulties in the mind associated with these three experiences. Because you can understand that it's not possible to have permanent youthfulness. It's not possible to have permanent health. And it's not possible to have permanent life or existence. But as long as the mind is unaware of the universal truth of impermanence and there's craving, desire, attachment in the mind, then one is going to experience discontentedness. But training the mind through the Eightfold Path, you can eliminate that. You can abandon and overcome these three difficulties where the mind might have discontentedness associated with aging, sickness, and death of your parents or of your children. And this is the guidance here of the Buddha is to learn and practice this Eightfold Path because it's a core central teaching that you would need in order to get to enlightenment. This is the path to enlightenment. This is your life practice. So you would need to know this inside and out, backwards and forwards, using the original words of the Buddha, which I share in all the courses, programs, retreats. I make sure that I teach the Eightfold Path because it's such a core central teaching. But if you haven't learned this with the original words of the Buddha, you might still be unclear about how to practice this Eightfold Path. So if you access the teachings that I share through Volume 1, Chapter 5, you'll be able to see the Eightfold Path in the words of the Buddha. And it's in other places in the book series, as well as the online classes, the retreats, the uh, programs that I teach. I'm teaching this in one way or another because every student who aspires to get to enlightenment through the teachings of the Buddha would need to know this Eightfold Path based in the words of the Buddha inside and out, backwards and forwards. You need to know it like the back of your hand. So any questions on this chapter, you can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. So let me go ahead and move on to the next chapter, which is chapter five. This is titled, Four Things Wished For, Desired, Agreeable, and Rarely Gained in the World. Here the Buddha shares, Householder, there are these four things that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and rarely gained in the world. What for? One thinks, may wealth come to me righteously. This is the first thing in the world that is wished for, desired, agreeable, and rarely gained in the world. 
having gained wealth rightly, righteously, one thinks, may fame come to me and to my relatives and preceptors. This is the second thing in the world that is wished for, desired, agreeable, rarely gained in the world. Having gained wealth righteously, and having gained fame for oneself and for one's relatives and preceptors, one thinks, may I live long and enjoy a long lifespan. This is the third thing in the world that is wished for, desired, agreeable, rarely gained in the world. Having gained wealth righteously, having gained fame for oneself and for one's relatives and preceptors, living long and enjoying a long lifespan, one thinks, with the breakup of the body after death, may I be reborn in a good destination, in a heavenly world. This is the fourth thing in the world that is wished for, desired, agreeable, rarely gained in the world. These are the four things that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and rarely gained in the world. There are, householder, four other things that lead to the obtaining those four things. What for? Accomplishment and confidence, accomplishment in virtuous behavior, accomplishment in generosity, and accomplishment in wisdom. Okay, so I'm just going to pause here for a moment and kind of make sure you guys are following along. So the Buddha is explaining that there's four things that an individual essentially is wanting in the world. There's wealth, fame, living a long life, and being reborn in the heavenly world. Well, the goal of the teachings of the Buddha aren't to be reborn in the heavenly world, as we talked at the beginning of the class. The goal is to get to enlightenment and escape the whole cycle of rebirth. But nonetheless, these are four things that human beings tend to oftentimes want in the world. And they're oftentimes wishing for it, desiring it, craving, desire, attachment to these types of things. Well, the Buddha is now going to explain to you, if it's those things that you're really interested in obtaining in the world, this is how you actually obtain it. But remember, the same things that lead to a rebirth in the heavenly world are the same things that lead to enlightenment as well. So the things that I'm going to share and that the Buddha is teaching here, these are the same things that you would like to practice in order to get to enlightenment. You're not interested in necessarily obtaining a heavenly rebirth, but instead learning and developing the mind and practicing to get to the point where you can get to enlightenment and escape the whole cycle of rebirth. So these things that he's sharing are very important for you to be able to accomplish that. So now he says, in what householder is accomplishment and confidence? Here, a householder, I'm sorry, here, a noble disciple is endowed with confidence. He places confidence in the enlightenment of the Tathagata. Thus, the perfectly enlightened one is an arahant, perfectly enlightened, accomplished in true wisdom and conduct, fortunate knower of the world, unsurpassed trainer of persons to be tamed, teacher of heavenly beings and humans, the enlightened one, the perfectly enlightened one. This is called accomplishment and confidence. So in most places where you see the Buddha talking about confidence, he's referring to confidence in him and his teachings, because in order to decide to investigate them and examine them, you would need to have some amount of confidence in him. And through investigating and examining them, and then independently reflecting to verify them, and then practicing them as you see the improvement to the condition of the mind, where it's becoming more peaceful and joyful, your confidence will only grow in the teachings, in the Buddha, and also the community that you're part of. So having confidence is an important thing to get to enlightenment. And you may not have confidence when you first get started, but as you investigate the teachings and you see the improvement to the mind, as you're independently verifying his teachings, your confidence can build, and more and more you can eliminate doubt. And what is accomplishment in virtuous behavior? Here, a noble disciple abstains from the destruction of life, abstains from what it, from taking what is not given, abstains from sexual misconduct, abstains from false speech, abstains from liquor, wine, and intoxicants, substances that cause heedlessness, the basis for heedlessness. This is called accomplishment in virtuous behavior. So here again, he's pointing to the five precepts, where if you look at the words of the Buddha in the five precepts, He has much more illuminating language. Here, he's just summarizing it and pointing to it. But if you look in volume one, chapter seven of the book series that I share, you'll see the original words of the Buddha on the five precepts because he gives much more illuminating language to be able to help you understand how to practice the five precepts. And that's what you would need in order to 
make your way to enlightenment. Because as long as you're practicing unvirtuous or unskillful behavior, you're causing harm in the world, and then harm is coming back to you. So by improving your moral conduct, you now are causing less and less harm in the world, and then you'll see less and less unwholesome things coming back to you. How would you be able to get to this peaceful and joyful mind in life if you're causing harm and harm keeps coming back to you? So the five precepts are a baseline minimum around virtuous behavior or moral conduct, but there's much more details that the Buddha shares on this in like the Eightfold Path under right speech, right action, and right livelihood. And then there's connecting teachings that connect into that that you would like to learn and develop as part of your growth and development on the path to enlightenment. In these book series and these courses and programs and retreats that I share, I share all of that with you. But this is a baseline minimum to get to accomplishment and virtuous behavior is to now practice this virtuous behavior. That's what's going to lead to improved wealth that you are able to then experience potentially fame or long life or this uh, rebirth in the heavenly world. And then he talks about accomplishment and generosity. And what is accomplishment and generosity? Here, a noble disciple resides at home with a mind free from the stain of selfishness, freely generous, open-handed, joyful in relinquishment, devoted to charity, joyful in giving and sharing. This is called accomplishment and generosity. Because remember, generosity is there to help you eliminate craving, desire, attachment. If you're looking to build wealth and build fame and build a long life and also an improved rebirth, you're going to need to get to the point where you're practicing generosity, where you're reducing and eliminating your craving, desire, attachment. When you have craving, desire, attachment in the mind, then the mind is longing and yearning. There's a lot of stress or frustration or anguish in the mind. This puts a burden on the body. And now the physical body, the heart is not as strong, the lungs aren't as strong, the other organs aren't working as well. But when you can free the mind of discontentedness, now the body doesn't have to work as hard and you'll experience a longer life. So practicing generosity is helping you to eliminate craving, desire, attachment so that you can experience a long life. Think about the Buddha. He lived until the age of 80. This is 2,500 years ago. I don't know what the average lifespan was back then, but I'm almost confident that it wasn't the age of 80. It was probably much less, maybe in the 30s or 40s. But here's an individual who lived all the way to the age of 80 back in those time frames when old age wasn't necessarily very common. So by freeing the mind, by getting to enlightenment, and now your mind can be peaceful and tranquil and joyful, you'll notice that you'll have a longer life. The way to get to the peace, tranquility, and joy is to practice elimination of craving, desire, attachment through breathing mindfulness meditation and practicing generosity of giving and sharing your time, effort, energy, and resources without any expectation of anything in return. And then lastly, the Buddha shares, and what is accomplishment in wisdom? If one dwells with a mind overcome by longing in unrighteous central desires, one does what should be avoided and neglects one's duties so that one's fame and peacefulness are spoiled. So he says the same thing here about ill will, complacency, restlessness and worry, and he also refers to it as doubt. These are what's called the five hindrances, that these five hindrances are obstructions to your enlightenment. These are pollutions of mind or defilements, which will hinder you from being able to get to your peacefulness and these other things that an individual might be longing and yearning for, which is wealth, fame, the long life, and an improved rebirth. So then the Buddha is explaining that when a noble disciple has eliminated these things, when you eliminate the longing and the yearning with central desires, when you eliminate the ill will, you eliminate the complacency, you eliminate the restlessness and worry, and you eliminate the doubt, you've eliminated these five hindrances, then having eliminated it, this is where having abandoned it, now an individual will experience more peace and more joy in their mind. There's more pollutions in mind than just the five hindrances or the uh, these obstructions, but you wouldn't be able to get to enlightenment as long as these obstructions are there in the mind. And I teach you what these are in detail, and the antidotes or solutions or remedies of how to eliminate them. 
I teach these in other classes and in, in the books. So if you would like to reference the online classes where I've taught these, you can go to the YouTube channel and you'll be able to search for the five hindrances and you'll see that I've taught this exactly what they are and how to eliminate them. And then of course the Buddha sums it up with having telling you what he told you, right? <laughs> so that's a common way that he would teach. So let me know what questions you guys have here on this chapter. I think you guys know how to answer, ask those questions by putting them into Facebook, YouTube, or in Zoom. Okay. So I don't see any questions here. So I'm going to move on to the next chapter, which is chapter six. Nine things rooted in craving. Here, the Buddhist teaching. I will teach you, monks, nine things rooted in craving. What are the nine things rooted in craving? Independence on craving, there is seeking. Independence on seeking, there is gain. On dependence on gain, there is judgment. Independence on judgment, there is desire and lust. Independence on desire and lust, there is attachment. Independence on attachment, there is possessiveness. Independence on possessiveness, there is selfishness. Independence on selfishness, there is safeguarding. With safeguarding as the foundation, originate the taking up of rods and weapons, fights, contentions, and disputes, accusations, argumentative speech, and false speech, and many other evil, unwholesome things. These are the nine things rooted in craving. So the teachings of the Buddha are based around the defilements or the taints or the pollutions and eliminating those from the mind. One of the significant ones that you're working to eliminate is craving desire attachment, this mental longing and strong eagerness. And that's what's leading to discontentedness. But because an individual has craving in their mind, not only is it leading to discontentedness, but it's leading to a lot of unwise decisions that then produce unwholesome results. So the Buddha here is kind of a master at showing you this cause and effect or this action and result, this causality of how one thing leads to another, and then that thing leads to another, and then that thing leads to another. So here he's taking craving, which he teaches all throughout his teachings, and he's explaining that that then leads to seeking, which is seeking things outside of yourself. And now when you're doing that, that's going to lead to gain. You're going to gain certain things in the world, certain material possessions. And then when you have certain material possessions, that's going to lead to you judging other people, determining, do they have more than me or do they have less than me? And now if you notice that people have more than you, this is going to lead to desire and lust where you're longing and yearning for more and more things. And then this is going to lead to attachment or clinging where you hold on to things very tightly. And now that's going to lead to this possessiveness where you're holding on to things. And then there's this selfishness where you're unwilling to share. And now it leads to this safeguarding where you're guarding all the things that you have, not wanting to lose anything. And now because of this, this leads to this taking up of weapons where now there's fights, contentions, disputes, accusations, argumentative speech, and false speech and other unwholesome things. So craving, yes, it leads to discontentedness, but it leads to a lot of unwise decision-making like what the Buddha is describing here. So let me know what questions you guys have on this chapter, nine things rooted in craving. All right, I'm not seeing anything here. So let me move on to the next chapter, which is chapter seven. This one is titled indebtedness is discontentedness in the world. Monks, isn't poverty discontentedness in the world for one who enjoys sensual pleasures? If a poor, impoverished, needy person gets into debt, isn't his indebtedness to discontentedness in the world for one who enjoys sensual pleasures? If a poor, impoverished, needy person who has gotten into debt promises to pay interest. Isn't the interest to discontentedness in the world for one who enjoys sensual pleasures? If a poor, impoverished, needy person who has promised to pay interest cannot pay it when it falls due, they admonish him. 
Isn't being admonished to discontentedness in the world for one who enjoys sensual pleasures? If a poor, impoverished, needy person who is admonished does not pay, they prosecute him. They prosecute him. Isn't prosecution to discontentedness in the world for one who enjoys sensual pleasures? If poor, impoverished, if a poor, impoverished, needy person I'm sorry, I lost my place. There was a little glitch in the computer there. If a poor, impoverished, needy person who is prosecuted does not pay, they imprison him. Is an imprisonment to discontentedness in the world for one who enjoys sensual pleasures? So, monks, for one who enjoys sensual pleasures, poverty is discontentedness in the world. Getting into debt is discontentedness in the world. Having to pay interest is discontentedness in the world. Being admonished is discontentedness in the world. Prosecution is discontentedness in the world. And imprisonment is discontentedness in the world. So too, monks, when one does not have confidence in cultivating wholesome qualities, when one does not have a sense of moral wrongdoing in cultivating wholesome qualities, when one does not have, a, have moral concern in cultivating wholesome qualities, when one does not have energy in cultivating wholesome qualities, when one does not have wisdom in cultivating wholesome qualities, in the noble one's discipline, one is called a poor, impoverished, needy person. So let me pause here for a bit and explain this, because this is the real crux of this discourse. The Buddha is talking about an individual getting into debt is discontentedness, because getting into debt is that you have a lot of craving of certain things that you want in some cases, and now you can't afford those things but you're going into debt. So you're kind of enjoying yourself with all these central pleasures, but you're actually harming yourself because you're going into debt and your life is kind of upside down in this case. So here the Buddha is explaining that the same thing is true if you're not having confidence and cultivating wholesome qualities, if you don't have this moral wrongdoing. What moral wrongdoing is, is knowing what's wholesome and unwholesome or wise and unwise. What moral concern is, is this is having the concern to not do unwholesome and unwise things. So if you don't have these qualities, the Buddha is essentially saying you're going into debt because as you produce more and more unwholesomeness through unwise decision-making, you're going to have to experience that unwholesome karma. It's going to come back to you either in this life or some future life. So by you continuing to lack wisdom and not knowing wholesome and unwholesome or wise and unwise and not having a concern to do uh, unwise things and unwholesome things, you're going to continue to go into debt. And also the Buddha talks about here, one that does not have energy, like motivation, encouragement, the ambition or initiative to do what is wise and wholesome. And then when one doesn't have wisdom about wholesome qualities, it's the same thing. This person is becoming indebted. They're impoverished and a needy person. And then the Buddha is going on, more and more in explaining all of that here. I'm just going to kind of move through this rather than reading it all. Um, there's a lot of detail here that you can read. He talks about by not having this these qualities that an individual at the time of death, because of their misconduct by body, speech, and mind, can be born into the hell realm or the animal realm. And he refers to them as prisons because once you get into those realms, it's very hard to get back out. We've all been in those realms at different times, pretty much, at one time or another. So now we're out. We're out of those lower realms. We've escaped that prison, and now we have the ability to cultivate the mind. But oftentimes an individual is complacent, which is one of those hindrances where the mind lacks ambition and initiative to be willing to actually learn and practice because there's a certain amount of work that is involved there. So... Then he goes on and just kind of explains more. You guys can read this as part of the book. His words are very important. And if you guys are reading this on your own, you'll be able to learn more and more about this. But me being able to read all this um, in one class is just kind of a bit much. So I'd like to just open up the questions that you guys have related to what the Buddha is teaching here. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions anywhere, so I'm going to move on to the next chapter. 
oops, which is chapter eight. And again, I'm not going to be able to read this whole chapter, but I'll explain to you what the Buddha is teaching. This is titled Welfare and Peacefulness in This Present Life. He's talking to a individual who's asking him questions. This person says, Venerable Sir, we are householders enjoying central pleasures, living at home in a house full of children. We use sandalwood from Kasi. We wear garlands, scents, and ointments. We receive gold and silver. Let the perfectly enlightened one teach us the teachings in a way that will lead to our welfare and peacefulness in this present life and in future lives. So here, this householder is asking, what is it that will lead to our peacefulness in this life? And now the Buddha provides these four teachings of what's going to lead to peacefulness. Accomplishment and initiative, accomplishment and protection, wholesome friendship, and balanced living. So here, accomplishment and initiative is having the initiative to apply yourself skillfully and diligently in your career. Whatever career or livelihood that you take, it's wise to apply wise decision-making there and be able to essentially carry out your duties in that role and responsibility to be able to build your career. The next thing he talks about is protection, that you ensure that you protect your wealth. In terms like nowadays, we might kind of get insurance or put it in a bank or have certain protected investments or things like that. Not the safeguarding that he was talking about before where you're guarding it with weapons, but instead that you put it away in a place that is well protected. The Buddha talks about preventing kings and thieves from taking it, fire, floods, and displeasing heirs. These are things like you might think of kings nowadays, you might think about the government, whereas if you didn't pay your taxes, they could come in and take a lot of your wealth. So be sure that you regularly pay your taxes and be sure you guard your wealth from thieves. That's by putting it into bank accounts or protected investments or having insurance or things like that. Uh, same thing with fires and floods, you know, that would be protected through insurance if you might decide to use that type of service. What displeasing heirs are, this is like if you had a, a, a will that you created and then you didn't tell anybody about it, then when you died, then people could be displeased. Whereas if you left money to certain people in your life, but then you let them know what you're leaving them before they die, before you died, then if they had any questions for you, you could answer those questions before you died. So they wouldn't be displeased by the time you die. And then having wholesome friendships, this is going to lead to your peacefulness. If you have unwholesome friends, then this is going to uh, cause difficulties in your life because you're going to be influenced and affected by their unwise decisions. So here the Buddha is giving you some guidance on that. And he does this in other discourses as well about how to cultivate wholesome friends. Then he talks about this balanced living. He talks about that your income should be higher than your expenses. Whereas if your expenses are higher than your income, you're kind of living life upside down and you're constantly going into debt. You're going to need to be able to repay this debt. So by ensuring that your income is a certain level and your expenses are below that, this allows you to live a balanced life. Whereas if you have a lot of craving, it's very expensive to chase your cravings and this might take you into debt. So it would be wise to arrange your income and expenditures so that you're not going into debt, but instead that you can maintain a comfortable lifestyle. Because as long as you're going into debt, this is going to burden the mind, stress the mind, and produce anxiety because the mind's having all this craving. So by you choosing to live a balanced life, you can reduce that pressure and that stress, and now you'll have a longer life because your mind is tranquil and the body is tranquil. You're not putting all this work on the body. So that's this particular chapter. Any questions here? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions here. So I'm going to move on to the next chapter, which is chapter nine. Here, this is titled Four Sources of Depletion and Accumulation of the Wealth. So here the Buddha is going to teach you four things that lead to depletion of your wealth and four things that lead to the accumulation of your wealth. And again, I'll just summarize it for you. You can read this in the book, volume eight, chapter nine. Okay. 
So here the Buddha is explaining womanizing, drunkenness, gambling, and unwholesome friendship is what's going to lead to the depletion of your wealth. What womanizing would be, and remember he's speaking to a man here, this is the student that's asking him a question. What womanizing would be, would be to chase around multiple partners and just spending your money frivolously trying to chase around and having casual sex with lots of different people. And a woman could potentially do this with women or a woman could do this with men too. So womanizing here, he's talking to a man who must be having a life partner or chasing after women that could potentially be doing that kind of thing. So the Buddha is using this term womanizing. But you can apply this to chasing after anybody and constantly chasing people wanting to have casual sex. This is very expensive. Whereas if you had uh, a loyal, committed relationship, you guys could build your life together and build wealth. Drunkenness or heedlessness, this is going to lead to the depletion of wealth because you're just spending money in order to get heedless. It's not producing any real benefit in your life. And now with your mind being heedless, you're going to make unwise decisions that lead to unwholesome results. Gambling is another one. Gambling is using your money and your resources, your income, to try to uh, play a game of chance and now for the hopes of winning uh, some more money. But oftentimes people get addicted to this and it's a downward spiral. It's going to deplete your wealth. And then same thing with unwholesome friends. If you have friends who are into unwholesome things, they're going to have all kinds of unwise decision making that leads to uh, difficulties in their life. And now they might be asking you, you know, can you come bail me out of jail? Can you pay for my lawyer? Can you fix my house? Can you fix my car? All these different things. So this is going to lead to the depletion of your wealth. And then the Buddha talks about accumulation of wealth is avoiding these four things. So by avoiding these four things, that's what's going to lead to the accumulation of your wealth because you're not going to have this, uh, you know, this outflow. Well, there's some another discourse that the Buddha shares where he talks about this flowing of water and he talks about you know, womanizing, drunkenness, gambling, and having unwholesome friends. It's like opening up these outlets and the water is just you know, free flowing out. But by you choosing not to do these things, it's closing the, the, the outlets. Actually, it's right here. You can see it where he's talking about closing these outlets. And now you're preserving the resources that you have because you're not just allowing them to flow out freely through womanizing, drunkenness, gambling, or having unwholesome friends. So let me know what questions you guys have here. And again, I recommend that you guys read these because you got the teachings of the Buddha in his words, and you've got words for me to be able to help you there as well. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, so we'll move on to the 10th chapter here, the very last one, which is four things that four things leading to the welfare and peacefulness in future lives. And these are all things that we've actually already studied. So the same things that lead to welfare and peacefulness in the future life is the same thing that's going to lead to welfare and peacefulness in this life and helping you to get to enlightenment. And it's these same four things that we've studied in the previous discourse, which is developing confidence, virtuous behavior, generosity, and wisdom. And the Buddha is explaining that in the exact same way that he did in the previous discourse. So let me see what questions you guys have on this or anything else that you guys would like to ask questions on. You can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, and I will answer your questions for you. Okay, let's see. I'm not seeing any questions in Zoom. I'm not seeing any in Facebook or YouTube either. So you guys must be understanding these to a certain degree, or maybe you need to go back and, and read these and study these more closely. In our next class on Saturday, we're going to be in chapters 11 through 20 of the same book, volume 8, The Foremost Householders. So if you'd like to study those before class or after class, and then come to class to be able to get help. This is more of a study group versus me just teaching. So if you decide that you would like to study these prior to class, then you can come to class and get help. Or if you'd like to just come here and study as part of our class, you can do that as well. Tomorrow in our group learning program at the temple and here through live streaming, now that I'm live streaming the morning class in the evening class, I'm going to be 
teaching chapter one of the group learning program. So volume one, chapter one, we're going to be starting from the very beginning of the book. This is titled Universal Teachings, Love, No Harm, and Good Morals. This is where you're going to learn about these universal teachings that really apply across all traditions, whether it's Christianity, Muslim teachings, Hindu, or other teachings, even Buddhism. You'll see these common theme amongst all the teachings that exist in the world. And I'm going to help you to see some of those connections and help you learn how you can use these universal teachings of love, no harm, and good morals to benefit you in developing your life practice. And then on Wednesday, we'll be in part two of our four-part series on loving-kindness meditation. So you're welcome to attend that or listen to any of the replays or watch any of the replays based on the teachings that I'm sharing that are based in the words of the Buddha. So thank you all for your interest to learn and practice the teachings. Thank you for your questions. We'll see you guys in a future class. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. Sawadee Thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much.